Hi everybody. So this is for chapter 23, the Great Depression and the New Deal. So at the end of last chapter, just briefly talked about the beginning of the depression, what caused it. I'm not going to go into any details on it. Um, basically unrealistic spending, that whole buy now, pay later mentality. Uh, people buying on margin, companies, um, unrealistic investing. Uh, instead of reinvesting in businesses, they were investing in the stock market, which kept going up and up and up. And uh, then, of course, it crashed in 1929. And that leads us into what we call the Great Depression. So when the Depression hit, it was a big surprise. Um, the 20s, we often refer to as the Roaring 20s, it was very, uh, it was a boom period, boom period. When it hit, it happened fast. It happened in a matter of months. And by 1931, two years into it, we had already seen over 100,000 businesses fail, close, 9,000 banks, uh, unemployment rising to about 25%. Uh, and that's average. Some states were much worse. Um, the three different classes of American population uh, were hit differently. The poor were hit the hardest. The poor working class were certainly hit the hardest. Uh, high unemployment. Uh, many people lost their homes, homeless. Millions of people homeless. Uh, middle class were hurt. Most of those survived. Um, and of course the rich, yeah, they were still rich. Um, the depression hit the bottom 50% of the population mostly. They're the ones that took the, took the brunt of this. Um, it became so bad. Well, let's look at the first year. The first year really, um, the way, because we had gone through many depressions and many ups and downs in the, in the business cycle of capitalism. So you have recessions, depressions every 20 years or so, almost like clockwork. None had ever been quite like this though. Um, and in those, the, that depression, usually the, for the first year of it, um, which is usually the worst, you have private charity, churches, synagogues, private businesses really stepping up, church, church, uh, churches, things like this, uh, bread line, soup kitchens, those kinds of things, um, giving charity, giving aid, they would often call it. Well, the problem is after about a year, that just seems to dry up because people have to start worrying about their own families. People stop giving donations, charity, um, and the lines get longer and longer as it gets worse and worse. It gets to the point where by the second year into it, if you needed something, you had to barter, like you would trade a haircut for dinner, for instance, or trade a day's work for a place to sleep at night things like that. And there really wasn't much support. The government wasn't into this at this point in time. The government didn't really believe it needed to support people. So little public support, little government support. Uh, the demand was overwhelming. Very little aid from the states. You had about eight, about eight states that actually had some type of unemployment insurance, but even then it was minimal. Um, and so for the first couple of years, this just seems to get worse. We end up having millions, tens of millions, starving, homeless, in the streets. Um, the hardest hit were often, uh, demographically, were often the poor, of course, but uh, age-wise, the youngest, the very young and the very old, uh, very hard to, to get money, get support. People typically in the past always relied on their families. If you needed some immediate assistance, well, your families are hard hit too, your families are starving, your families can't pay the bills. Um, so the bread line, soup kitchens, and what aid there was couldn't even really begin to help the millions of people. Uh, some changes to family, of course, very significant. Uh, people delaying marriage, delaying having children. Um, you can't take care of your family. You're not going to start a family, uh, many people. Um, that was very common. Um, we see some interesting things with women and working. Uh, we actually see, even though unemployment rises, it affects men mostly. We actually see more women working. We actually see an increase in female employment. It's not good employment. It's poor employment. It's low pay. It's part-time. 
uh, service industry employment. We actually see it because men simply can't make enough money, can't find jobs, can't work enough hours. So previously, many housewives uh, had to go out and get jobs. They had to work uh, to help support their family, to keep them from being on the streets. So uh, industry, industrial employment, and teaching. Teaching is an interesting example. Uh, many school districts actually banned women from working there. Many companies did this. And the point of it was to give men jobs so that men would have work. Uh, and yet we still actually see women's employment increase. The hardest hit, uh, another aspect of demographics is African-Americans and uh, Native Americans. Immigrants, African-Americans, Native Americans, minorities uh, were often at higher unemployment rates. That 25% was an average. If you actually look at just uh, minority groups like African-Americans had unemployment almost triple, almost triple uh, of a white person so you're looking at high, very high unemployment rates for minorities, uh, people of color, immigrants, um, things like that. Uh, women unemployment rates were, were uh, uh, not that high, obviously. We see more women working, but they often worked very poor jobs, uh, not dependable, high quality work, high pay jobs. Women are still making half of what a man makes. Uh, so a woman would have to work three times as many hours often or, or have three times as many days of work just to make what a man would make in something comparable. Uh, the hardest hit part of America, Midwest, Plains, um, and the Northeast. That's where the industrial employment is. Um, we talked about that in the last chapter in the 1920s, almost one-seventh of all Americans were some way tied to automobile uh, manufacturing. Uh, which almost shuts down, not completely. You know, there's still cars being made, but m m far fewer. And so with the industries closing down, the factories closing down, steel production, things like this, well, that puts many people unemployed from the Great Lakes over to like New York. But where all the raw materials come from? The Midwest, where they get the iron and all the different raw materials, well, that shuts down those towns as well. Uh, the supply lines dry up because they don't need the raw materials because the factories aren't producing. Um, in the South and in farming areas, unemployment actually remains relatively low. Uh, the Dust Bowl is an exception, but we'll talk about that later. But because people still need to eat, people still need food. So industrial employment drops dramatically, while other types of unemployment, some of them remain stable. Uh, just depends on the part of the country you're in. This is a good example here of women and how women are a uh, good example of women working and how the states are getting involved. This is from the Illinois Employment Agency, and it gives you an idea of how the states are actually stepping up. Uh, and for the first time, being the middle person, the middleman. Previously, if you got a job, you were expected to get the job. If you worked, you were expected to work. You were expected to make money. You were expected to take care of your family. Now we see an impetus on uh, the public calling for the states to intervene and the states to actually help people get work, help people get jobs. This was unheard of in previous generations. You wanted a job, you ain't got one. Now you have the states trying to get you jobs. And this particular advertisement with this very happy looking woman is uh, for girls and women in household employment. This would be like a servant. Servant, nanny, maid, cook, uh, live in, uh, help, things like that. Um, that the state is helping women get this work. Uh, good pay, good surroundings, um, good working conditions. Uh, well, that might be an exaggeration, uh, but it's better than starving. Uh, these were probably pretty low quality jobs, pretty menial labor jobs, but it's certainly better than being on the street or homeless or starving. Plus it actually benefited some families because a family didn't have to support their 18 year old daughter, for instance. She could now go out and, and have her own job. It actually took a burden off the of families. They may not have to support a member or two members of their family that was now living with someone else, getting their, their, uh, their needs met there. But it's an interesting thing. Now, the president at the time was Herbert Hoover. Uh, he was elected in uh, 28, took over as president in 29. Hoover responds to this. <sighs> Very limited fashion, um, although expected, really. He follows American traditions, a couple of American traditions. Um, 
One, where your economic status, your economic place in society is really your own, it's your own fault, good or bad. If you're successful, if you're wealthy, if you're, if you're doing well, it's because you did it. If you're poor, if you're homeless, if you're doing terribly, it's because you did it. It's really you. Um, you will succeed. You will be successful if you work hard. And you won't be if you don't. Pretty simple. And also the idea that there would be what we would call these voluntary business actions of wealthy and middle class, which would help fill the gaps. So if you were in a situation where things were bad, you were down your luck for a while, you wouldn't be on the dole. On the dole is where the government was taking care of you. The government was giving you charity. You wouldn't be on the dole. You would get help from a local business, a local charity, a local church, synagogue, a local um, uh, institution of some sort, or the middle class. The middle class or the rich would give charity or donations or fund soup kitchens, bread lines, homeless shelters, things like that. That was the idea. Uh, well, you know, a lot of that does happen in the first year, first year or two. But the problem is the depression doesn't end. It doesn't even get better. It just continues getting worse. Matter of fact, through his entire presidency, and, and Hoover was president for pretty much his entire presidency was the depression. Uh, it just gets worse and worse. Um, uh, he encourages, he encourages Americans to do some things. Um, he encourages Americans to work hard, to look for work, to, to be brave, um, to be confident. Um, he does cut taxes while he reassures American, he does cut some taxes. Well, that's how useful is that really? Uh, most of the people being hurt by the depression didn't pay taxes. Um, most common people didn't pay taxes. We didn't really, I don't think we, we had even a, uh, we didn't have an income tax yet at this point, I don't believe. So the majority of Americans didn't pay taxes. Most taxes were paid by the rich, the wealthy, or businesses. Uh, so cutting taxes really only helped the rich. Didn't really do anything for the working class Americans. Uh, he did call for state and local governments to do things. He called for state and local governments to help. Well, but they were quickly overwhelmed. They were quickly overwhelmed by this. Uh, charity and local business and middle class actions and wealthy and all that, the help they did give, well, after a year or two, you start to see that simply dry up um, because it doesn't get better. It only gets worse. We do get the RFC created. Uh, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation is created that he signs into law. And the RFC mainly uh, gives money and loans to big companies, railroads, banks, big businesses, really just helping the wealthy. Now, the idea behind it is, is pretty, pretty direct. Uh, if the business stays in business, then the business continues to employ its employees. In other words, keep the business afloat and the business keeps its workers, uh, which of course helps everybody. Well, that's wonderful, but we, it doesn't actually work out that way. You see many, many businesses just hold on to the money um, and try to keep themselves out of bankruptcy. And they don't keep their workers uh, because if they took that money and then spent it on the workers' payrolls, they would be back where they were originally. They still wouldn't have any money. So they keep the money to try and keep themselves afloat, meanwhile firing many of their workers uh, or cutting their hours or cutting their pay. There's no laws yet for minimum wage, so they could do whatever they want. Uh, and of course, everyone's looking for work, so they could cut their pay 70, 80% and people would still work for them because they have to. Uh, even a little bit of money is better than nothing. So the RFC didn't really have an impact. Uh, uh, it's not really a noticeable impact. Overall, the perception of what Hoover did was bad, bad, bad. Uh, he was in newspapers, they call him the do nothing president. So yeah, but it should be noted, most presidents would have done the same. Hoover, in, in that place of Hoover, most other presidents would have taken similar actions. This American tradition idea he followed was pretty standard at the time. It really was uh, that you should take care of yourself and the government shouldn't be taking care of you. It's hard to say would have been much different um, uh, in most cases, generally. And so as we move through Hoover's presidency, we see how America is responding to this and how America sees it. As I said, they see him sort of as a do-nothing president. Um, it even got to the point that 
uh, the media, newspapers, and people in general started to call these uh, these towns, these what we call shanty towns, which started to rise up on the outside of major cities, New York, Chicago, Atlanta, places like that. We start seeing these sort of uh, uh, makeshift towns made of wood and cardboard and scrap. Uh, they start calling them Hoovervilles. It's where all the homeless people are living. They don't have any place to live. They have no, uh, they can't pay rent. They can't pay their mortgages, things like that. They start living in these what we call Hoovervilles all across America. There's dozens of them. And of course, they're sleeping under Hoover blankets, which is a, a newspaper. So everything that's bad in the Depression, people start to blame on Hoover. They start to blame it all on him. Um, we also see a lot of violence. It's interesting. Many people feel like the one necessity you have to have is food. Um, sleep outside if you have to. Sleep in an alley if you have to, but you still have to have food. And so there's a lot of pressure on farmers uh, to give up their food at cheaper and cheaper prices, even give away their food for free. And many farmers resist this. Uh, of course, it's logical. If they start giving away their food for free, they start giving away at discounts, they're not going to be able to pay their bills or their mortgages, and they'll go out of business. So we see some responses to this, something like the, this, the Farm Holiday Association. Uh, farmers get together, they declare a holiday, and they destroy or burn or dump out all their food. They, they waste it all um, on this holiday. And it's to make a point. Um, that if you expect us to give our food away for free or you expect us to give it at such a deep discount because people are starving, well, then we're going to starve. Then we're going to lose everything. So we might as well just destroy it because it's useless for us. So we do see a lot of resistance, a lot of pushback from businesses, from people who are still doing okay, people who are still surviving uh, versus the rest of America, the millions of people who are not doing well. Um, we see violent labor protests. River Rouge plant, for instance, 1932, that's a uh, Ford, a Ford plant, uh, one of the plants that's still working, and they have a limited employment. And so we see a, a riot there, 1932, 55 people dead or injured. We see a coal miner strike uh, in Kentucky, for instance, where dozens of people were killed or injured. Uh, they had to bring in the National Guard, bring in the National Guard to, to uh, break it up and to end the violence. In times of need, when people are starving and literally dying in the streets, freezing to death in the streets in the winters, people are desperate. And if you think you're going to die anyway, you're perhaps willing to do almost anything uh, if you think your children or your family is going to die. Another interesting response to this was in 1932, uh, World War One veterans got together. Uh, they march on Washington. They call themselves the Bonus Army. Now, what they want is their pensions. They want their pensions, their uh, military pensions, their veterans. They're World War One veterans, and they want their pensions early. Instead of waiting to, uh, to uh, a more elderly age, they want their pensions now. They want their what they call their bonuses. That's what they called them. That was their, their pension, their bonuses. They went to Washington. They marched on Washington. Um, the U.S. Army was called in by Hoover, and they were forcibly evicted, arrested, and kicked out. What's interesting is this is sort of what happened back in uh, the, what, 1893, I think, uh, with Coxie uh, during that Depression in the 90s where Coxie and other armies marched on Washington. Uh, asking for assistance, asking for help. This is different. Uh, similar idea, asking for the government for relief from the government. However, this time it was recorded. We don't have TV yet, but we do have all the movie theaters. We have, and that's how many people get their news, their, uh, their entertainment is through the movies. Um, so this is recorded on newsreel footage. It's shown in the movie theaters. Their newspapers were there. They recorded it. They wrote stories about it. We see a national outrage, national outrage against this. These are our veterans that just 10 years earlier 
had literally saved the world from the Germans, uh, World War I, um, and now they're being treated like criminals. And all they're doing is asking for what they, what they deserve, what they're owed. They simply don't want to wait for it. They want it now. Certainly, certainly heard Hoover's, because remember, 32 is the election year. 32 is coming up for re-election. Uh, it certainly hurt his chances of re-election uh, coming up later that year. Um, and uh, spoiler alert, he doesn't get re-elected. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. It, footage of the army attacking and beating and injuring veterans and burning their camp did not do well. Did not do well in the media. And it certainly made, add all of it together and um, it did not bode well for Hoover's chances of getting re-elected in 32. Well, talking about the election, we move right into the election of 32. Well, we have uh, the Hoover is the Republican running, and we have Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who is uh, the cousin of the earlier president, Teddy Roosevelt. And he was the governor of New York. During the Depression, he instituted all kinds of very innovative, interesting relief programs. Uh, programs for food, unemployment, jobs, um, all kinds of things to actually help. And while most of America was suffering greatly, uh, uh, FDR, as we'll call him, FDR was really tr pushing to get New York through it, um, which was at the time, I would, I would think the largest population in the U.S. was probably in New York State, I would imagine. He was wealthy. He was an elitist from a wealthy family. Um, he served as the assistant secretary of the Navy during World War I, so he had military experience of, of a sort. However, in 1921, he suffered a polio attack, which, which suffered, which injured him significantly. He was uh, then confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. He lost most of the use of his legs. Um, uh, they hid this during the election. They didn't make this obvious. A lot of people voted for FDR. didn't know he was disabled. The Democrats, he was a Democrat, believed it would negatively influence his, re his election chances. And considering the time period, if you consider everything we talked about in the 1920s, how much racism and prejudice and bigotry and um, uh, discrimination against minorities, disabled, mentally ill, if you think about all that that happened in the 20s, the Democrats were probably right. Uh, to had every voter known that FDR was disabled and couldn't walk, um, who knows? Who knows if he would have won the election? And unless he runs, he wins, he wins the election. Well, here's the deal. He is elected in November, but at the time, presidents don't take office until the following March. So he's elected in November, and then he has to sit for four months. Uh, before he actually takes office in March. And of course, Hoover's lost now. So Hoover realizes he's lost, it's over. So he's he's just sitting there waiting to leave. Uh, he does nothing. He just disappears for, for weeks at a time. No one even sees Hoover. You know, he doesn't do any public speeches. He doesn't do any, any news broadcasts. He doesn't do anything. He just simply disappears. Um, so for the last few months of his presidency, he certainly was do nothing. Uh, interestingly enough, this was the worst winter of the Depression up to this point. That winter of 32 to 33, thousands and thousands of people died, more homelessness. Um, unemployment grew up over 25% during that winter. Uh, some states were as high as 80%. Ohio, for instance, uh, places in Ohio, 50, 60, 80%. Toledo. Cleveland, Akron, uh, incredible unemployment rates. These were these were uh, cities which had industrial manufacturing before, which is now out of business. Um, we see more banks close, more businesses close, and frankly, everything just gets worse. Meanwhile, Hoover does nothing, and FDR can do nothing, as he's not technically president yet. Um, unemployment gets even worse up in the Northeast, as I just said. Uh, this is FDR. He does this. He actually goes out and shakes hands of people uh, riding in the car, uh, sort of hiding his disability. Um, here, this is probably a staged photo. We see a picture here with a coal miner. Um, his wife, his wife, Eleanor, often known as the uh, the conscience 
of the New Deal. She would go out in the crowds, kiss the baby, shake the hands, and hug everybody, uh, while he would, of course, had to be on the sidelines, sort of. Uh, it just gives you an idea that this was this man was very popular. FDR is one of our most popular presidents. Very high approval ratings. People loved him. Um, meanwhile, uh, for much of his presidency, his illness was generally hidden from the public. Most people didn't know about it. It does come out later. By then, he's so popular. He's done so much for America. It doesn't really matter. Well, the programs he brings into America, these innovative programs that really changes our economy, changes, well, there's really no other way to put it. He changes our entire government. FDR creates a new American government uh, in his image, and um, he reshapes our entire society. He, uh, this program is known as the New Deal. Um, and then, of course, a little bit later, there's the second New Deal. We often call this the first 100 days Congress, or pardon me, the 100 days Congress. In his first 100 days in office, he introduces, and with uh, assistance of Congress, they introduce dozens of new ideas, new laws, new, uh, new organizations, new administrations uh, to change United States government, to address the Depression, which by the time he comes into office has only gotten worse for years and was not, there was no signs of it improving, no signs of it getting better at all. Many people loved him. Many people thought he was great. Uh, they even typically referred to him as FDR, uh, his initials. Um, they would even say, you know, FDR helped us, or he helped us, or he gave us a job, or he put food on the table, or he's looking out for us. You know, in previous generations when people would say things like that, they would usually be referring to God. He, God, you know, he helped us, he took care of us. Now, no, now they're referring to FDR. FDR brings in a lot of uh, scientists, um, not, not, not like lab scientists, like political scientists. Political scientists, he brings in uh, economists, brings in professors, things like that. And these people become what we call his, his brains trust. In essence, he brings in the best and the brightest, the smartest people he can find, mostly people, people from colleges, universities, to tell him how to fix America. What can we do to fix America? How can we fix our country? And this 100 Days Congress, in the first 100 days of presidency, introduces about 15 bills, 15 new laws that he signs in. And these laws mostly deal with unemployment issues, business, and banking, mostly, because that seems to be the deal. People are unemployed, banks are closing, which of course people lose their money, they lose their savings and of course businesses going under. So we see all that. Um, he declares a bank holiday immediately after becoming president, um, like his very first day in office, he declares his bank holiday. He closes all banks in the US. Probably didn't have the right to do that, probably didn't have the authority to do that. Um, it's really very unclear that he actually had the, uh, the power to do that, nonetheless he does it. Uh, he declares this bank holiday as part of the Emergency Banking Act. That's that EBA, the Emergency Banking Act. The Treasury Department closes all banks. Um, uh, about 10 days later, banks start reopening. They start to reopen. Uh, this massively reduces permanent closures. By closing them and then having the Treasury actually send agents to each bank, and the idea was that the banks would then ensure that they had enough reserves, enough deposits to actually open the doors up again. And they would control people taking out money. So the banks wouldn't go out of business completely. They wouldn't run out of all their money, all their reserves. Uh, in just six months before he became president, over 4,000 banks closed, like permanently closed uh, in the United States. Um, in the few months after he became president, it was a couple dozen. Now, whether that's entirely because, let's face it, there weren't that many banks left, because by this time, over 9,000 banks have closed. Maybe there weren't that many banks even left, um, or because of the EBA, or a combination of both. It certainly changed the way banking worked in America, and we're going to see other changes to that as well uh, that we'll also talk about here in a little bit. 
Um, he also starts his fireside chats, which really makes a difference. At the time, this is before television, so at the time, people got their news pretty much either newspapers or movie theaters or a new technology, which had been around for a few years now, the radio. And most homes had radios. Like today, everybody's got a TV, right? Every home has a television. Uh, back then, every, every home had a radio. And that's how you would hear news programs, you would hear entertainment programs, music programs, um, and of course, president. The president would come on at night uh, every week and he would talk to the American population, the American public. And people would sit by their fireplace, you know, sort of uh, you know, metaphorically, you know, not everyone had it. You know, you sit by your fireplace or by your fire or by your burning trash can um, and you would listen to a radio or you listen to a loudspeaker in factories. They would have the speakers or they have a speaker on a street. And everybody would listen to the president talk in these fireside chats. And basically, he was reassuring the American population telling everybody it's going to be okay. It's going to be hard. It's going to be tough, uh, but we're going to get through this, uh, this type of reassurance. Um, and this is one of the reasons people really thought of him as FDR. People felt like they knew him. They'd sit there with their families and listen to him talking five feet away on the radio, telling them how he was going to fix America, what the government was going to do to save people's lives. And then he does these things. Uh, we also get another thing comes out of this 100 Days Congress, the FDIC, uh, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which guarantees your deposits in banks for $2,500. This is another thing which really helps banks stop closing because most people did not have over $2,500 in a bank. So this would have covered most Americans. And the idea then was that if your money's in the bank and the bank does close for some reason, you don't have to go running to the bank to get your money because the government's gonna guarantee it. So if the bank closes and shuts up at doors and you show up there Monday morning and there's no bank anymore, the government will give you up to $2,500 uh, to reimburse you for any losses. Um, it also stops banks from making risky investments, which was one of the causes of the depression. Banks taking all that money people were giving them and putting it in the bank and then taking that money and investing in the stock market. One of the reasons so many banks closed. People come asking for their money and the banks don't have the money. The money's literally gone because they invested in the stock market, which was going up, and then the stock market crashed, and then the banks lost all their money, all their deposits. And people show up and like, oh, we don't have any money for you. Sorry, it's all gone. Um, the FDIC prohibits uh, risk, uh, investing in risky stuff like that in the stock market. Uh, another thing we get is um, changes in agriculture and manufacturing. This is all part of this 100 Days Congress. You get the AAA. The Agricultural Adjustment Act, um, basically it's really government regulates the farm economy because the farm economy was in such shambles. Everybody needed food. I mean, we talked about the Farm Holiday Association. And so the government steps in to try and make sure the prices are fair on food and to try and ensure that food production continues. As I said, many people can survive on the street without a roof over their head, but you have to have food. You have to have food products. Uh, however, we do know that it mostly helped big business. The AA mostly helped big business and big farms. Did very little to help the poor average farmer, and it did almost nothing to help sharecroppers, which is what um, most African American farmers were what we call sharecroppers, and uh, did very little to help them, for instance. Uh, also, we get the NRA, the National Recovery Administration, the National Recovery Administration. Um, it helps to subsidize uh, businesses. Um, it creates a network of over 600 private organizations in all of what, what the government identifies as the 600 most important industries in America. Uh, yeah, good luck even trying to number that, I mean, and not name that many industries, right? Uh, so over 600 important industries in America and creates an association for each one of them that the government oversees. And the association is supposed to make sure these businesses are operating, they're having fair prices, they're staying in business, they're giving out loans, things like that. Ultimately, what do these AAA, NRA, and by the way, there's others, what do they really do? Mostly they help the businesses. Very little actual help for workers. Now, by keeping the businesses afloat and keeping the businesses working, does it help workers indirectly? Of course it does. Uh, some workers are certainly helped simply by the business, by them keeping their jobs. 
If the business stays working, then you get to keep your job. But as far as actual direct help to the to employees, very little. And you might think, well, you know, they get to keep their job. That's great. Well, it certainly is good, but you must understand there's no requirements on wages. So companies can still drop their wages down to nothing. There's so many people wanting jobs. They don't have to worry about it if you, if you quit or you're unhappy because they'll find someone else who's willing to work for 20% of what they paid before the depression. Um, so as I said earlier, a lot of companies, they would simply hoard the money instead of giving out to the workers. The view being, hey, if I'm just going to give the money to the workers and take care of the workers, well, I'm still going to go out of business. So they would hoard the money to try and uh, give to their, their, their investors, their stock owners, uh, their executives, and simply to try to fend off uh, an, uh, uh, bankruptcy, to fend off bankruptcy. A lot of this money didn't really help workers. It really didn't, unfortunately. Uh, especially agriculture, especially when you consider how many minority and immigrants were doing agriculture. A couple other programs were certainly much more beneficial to workers, directly workers. Um, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration was a new uh, government administration, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. It was created to directly give federal money to the states. This is the first time we have a program specifically designed to give money to the states. Now this avoids giving direct payments to people. However, when the states get the money, the states will sometimes use that money and give direct payments to people. Um, but the government still wasn't willing to do that, wasn't willing to give money to people. They gave the money to the states and then the states are supposed to find a way to use the money to stimulate business, to stimulate growth, to help unemployed, things like that. Um, Another thing the government does is it creates the PWA, CWA, and the CCC. Um, this puts millions of people to work building infrastructure in America. Um, these three agencies, the Public Works Administration, uh, the Civil Works Administration, and the Civilian Conservation Corps. This puts millions, ultimately it puts almost 10 million people to work, uh, being paid for by the state or by the federal government. It puts people to work building infrastructure, roads, bridges, gazebos, parks, um, public buildings, city halls, schools, sidewalks, literally anything you can think of that is made of steel, stone, concrete, iron, um, that use, that, they, that could be used for the public, uh, universities, all kinds of stuff. And it puts millions of people to, get to, to work being paid for by the government, either the state or the federal government, giving them jobs. Um, these different agencies, CCC, PWA, CWA, uh, become the driving force, the number one most important driving force behind uh, ending the depression. Uh, with the government paying for all these people going to work. Again, they don't technically work for the government. They work for the states, they work for these agencies. But who funds the states, who funds the agencies? The federal government. This gives you a map here showing some of the different places, the CCC for instance. Civilian Conservation Corps would go out and build parks, bridges, uh, gazebos, um, they helped build national parks, state parks, city parks, a lot of outdoor stuff, a lot of uh, things that would be out in the uh, <clears throat> out in the public uh, for public use all across America. A good thing to talk about here, though, is how the CCC was run, how many of these programs were run. This was still a time of racism, segregation, prejudice, and bigotry in America. Uh, these camps, these jobs were often still segregated. Uh, white men and black men had to work separately. They had to sleep separately. Um, they would work on different projects. Um, so across much of America, we still see Jim Crow segregation and discrimination prevalent, even in the time of probably our, our largest national emergency ever in, in this country's history. Um, well, the Civil War, maybe the American Civil War, uh, but certainly uh, ranks right up there um, with our largest crisis up to this point in time. Of course, World War II is coming. Um, and 
uh, we're still worried about racism, segregation, prejudice. <clears throat> uh, it just shows, it just shows that even in such a time of crisis, the government and many people still couldn't look past their prejudices. Even when people are starving and dying in the streets, uh, racism and, and, and segregation were so much a part of American culture and American society that we could not, even in the face of death, we simply couldn't overlook it. It's really tragic, really. Well, the New Deal came under attack by a lot of people. Uh, they were not... It's interesting. There was attacks on both sides, on the more conservative right and the more liberal left, uh, more progressive left, we would have said. Lots of critics. Critics on the right, many said he's simply gone too far. Uh, what he was doing was not government's place. Uh, the government's place was not to create all these programs, to put all these people to work, uh, gone way too far. The Liberty League, the Liberty League was created by the Republican Party, uh, by people who were part of the Republican Party. Uh, they called this socialism. They believed it was too much. It was socialist, compared it to communism, uh, the government uh, giving people jobs, controlling industry, uh, controlling the distribution of goods, things like that. Uh, they said it was socialist reform, basically. We see NAM, the National Association of Manufacturers, National Association of Manufacturers. They created a whole, whole slew of radio ads, newspaper ads, promotional mailings, all promoting free enterprise and capitalism. In other words, the government should not be regulating, subsidizing, uh, controlling, or oversight of business. Uh, businesses need to take care of themselves, and they'll naturally correct. Well, you know, this was 33, uh, 34 when all this was happening, and the Depression had been going on since 29. It wasn't happening. Uh, much of their argument was simply false. Uh, several years into it, nothing had actually happened. Things were only getting worse. Unemployment rising, things like that. Um, uh, we also see the Supreme Court. Uh, from 35 to 37, the Supreme Court strikes down many of the New Deal reforms, strikes down many of them, uh, saying they are simply unconstitutional. However, it should be noted, they're probably right. Much of what FDR did was probably unconstitutional. He probably didn't have the authority to do a lot of it. Um, of course, bear in mind, Congress did pass most of these laws. Uh, some were executive orders, but the Congress passed many of the laws and FDR simply signed them. So it could be argued if Congress passed the laws, well, nonetheless, the Supreme Court was more conservatively aligned at the time and struck down many of his programs. Um, and his administrations from 35 to 37. We see quite a few of them uh, get removed. Although some he simply replaces when we get the second New Deal. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. Now, what about on the left, the more conservative progressive left, or when the time period we would use the term populist? Many said he simply hadn't done enough. What he was doing was great, but you know what? There's still millions of people unemployed, out of work, homeless, living in shanty towns. Uh, America hasn't recovered. Uh, it might be starting to recover, but it hasn't. So he needs to simply keep, keep doing what he's doing and even do more of it. Dr. Francis Townsend, for instance, created something we call, or he called, the Old Age Revolving Pension Plan, where he suggested uh, the government should give $200 to everybody over 60 uh, every month, 200 bucks a month for over 60 which back then $200 a month was quite a lot of money. That was, that was, that was a significant uh, amount of income, 200 bucks a month for everyone over 60. It would kill two birds with one stone. He argued, uh, fair argument. Uh, one, it would free up jobs for younger people. It would uh, take older people out of work and would free up jobs for younger people. Uh, the idea being younger men would have families to support. You're 60, you probably don't have a family to support. You have a wife and kids to take care of, free up a job for that. And next, since one of the hardest hit demographics were elderly, uh, who had, in some cases, close to an 80% unemployment rate, um, they're starving, they can't get work, uh, they can't be taken care of. I mean, if you had a choice of hiring a 20-year-old able-bodied man or a 60-year-old man, most people would, would choose the 20-year-old man. 
so they're very disadvantaged. So it gives them money, frees up jobs. Uh, of course, we know this will become something else later, but uh, we're not quite there yet. Father Charles Coughlin was a Detroit, a Detroit uh, priest, radio priest, um, sort of a televangelist before there was televangelists. Uh, he was thought to be the most listened to man in America other than the president. Uh, 30 to 40 million people every every week would listen to his radio preaching programs. And he called for nothing specific, but he called for more changes. He simply said FDR needed to do more. He, he needed to help people more and, and take more action. Uh, not less, but take more action. Senator Huey Long, for instance, uh, had some plans. He was in uh, Louisiana, uh, Senator Louisiana. I think, he'd even, I think he'd even been governor of Louisiana, maybe, at some point. Uh, he was also a very corrupt politician, a uh, very corrupt politician. However, he decided to try to run for president, and he was he gave indication he was going to run against FDR in the 36 election, and he came up with a plan to appeal to people we call the Share Our Wealth Society. Share Our Wealth Society, this was something that he would have probably led into his election with, um, and he argued... Um, he does this around 34. He argues that the problem we have in society is the rich have all the money. Hey, go figure. Um, and he argued for a 100% tax. 100% tax on wealthy. I think over a million. Anyone who made over a million dollars in income. 100% of that. So every penny over a million goes back to the government, goes to help, goes to relief, goes to aid. Um, sounds like a good plan to me. Well, um... Uh, most people would have been very hesitant to do something like that. Um, but it was still popular. On the populist left, it was popular. Uh, most populists would have been poor, working class folks that would have loved to have had a, a share of that million dollar plus prize. Well, what Roosevelt feared, probably more than anything, um, as, you know, as I've said in class, what a politician wants more than anything in the world is to be reelected. Uh, and their argument is simple. I can't help you if I'm not in office. So I have to be elected first, then I can help you. So I have to get elected. So being elected is so important. And so what FDR fears is in the 36th election, he actually fears a split. He actually fears the populist left might actually split. And as we know in an election, if you have a multi-split in a party to where a party goes to two different candidates, that usually leaves the other party to step in and take over. To win, we saw that 1912 with um, Wilson winning the election, uh, the split because of Teddy Roosevelt, and we would have seen that in 36 as well. Had we really seen this three-way split, uh, very possibly FDR would have lost, and uh, the two liberal uh, populist people, FDR and the other, would have lost, and probably would have allowed a more conservative Republican in to become president in 36. So what does he do? He basically goes left. Roosevelt becomes, because Roosevelt was an elitist, Roosevelt was wealthy. He was a Democrat, but he was actually pretty moderate before all this depression hit. He was actually pretty moderate before the depression. The depression forces him to move left, to move more liberal, more populist, more progressive. And then the 36 election forced him to even go further because he has to. He starts adopting all these programs. He starts taking all these ideas, old age revolving pension plans, share wealth. He starts taking these and he makes them his programs. Uh, helping uh, in the next election, hoping it will help his chances of winning. It does. Um, uh, and he had his reasons for doing that. Here you can see uh, lots of unrest across America, political strikes, protests, political action. Uh, and of course you can see where it's most hard, most hard hit up here in the Northeast. This was the industrial center of America, and we could see where we have many, many things, um, uh, many different issues and problems. If you do have the book, you can reference all these numbers. These numbers actually reference into the book, and it'll, it'll describe all these different incidents. Um, and lots of unrest, lots of problems, lots of people dying and killing each other over opportunities for jobs, housing, uh, frankly, food, frankly get into food and stuff like that. So we'll move into what we call the second New Deal, uh, the welfare state, which comes into being in America. All right. 
This is sort of this final shift between Republicans and Democrats. This is something I talked about earlier, um, chapter 21, probably 22, talked about how the Republican and the Democratic Party seem to switch um, sort of between the two, their ideologies, their focus on the working class seems to really switch. Uh, this is really where it, it sort of becomes defined for the next hundred years, uh, or at least the next 80 years. Uh, really happens in this time period. Uh, this had been moving this way for 30 years. Since the early 1900s, Democratic Party had been moving more and more towards uh, uh, social liberal reform, populism, and uh, minorities. And this is the time period when the African American, African American population moves from the party of Lincoln, Republican Party, to the party of FDR. This is when the African-American population shifts allegiances from one party to the other, and it's never looked back. Um, still to this day, the African-American party is almost entirely Democrat-leaning, and it really happens as a result of FDR. Uh, Roosevelt has to move left, as I said, for the election. He has no choice. He believes he must do it uh, to win and avoid any type of split election, <clears throat> and he does. Uh, to combat the critics, he adopts versions of the share of the wealth, business taxes, old age uh, pension plan, and dramatically increases popularity among minorities, blacks, uh, and working class, generally speaking. He adopts these programs. Uh, we get the creation of the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board. The NLRB, created in 35 specifically to uphold workers' rights, labor rights. We say labor, we're referring to workers, we're referring to unions, sometimes referred to as unions, so to uphold labor and workers' rights. Um, to give a lot of benefits, uh, gave, their right, uh, gave them guarantee them the right to join unions. It also outlaws many industries' ability to fire, fire people because they go on strike or because they ask for um, assistance or help from a business, for instance. Um, it protects their rights to collective bargaining, protects their rights to uh, going on strikes, to uh, walk in the picket line, to request for higher wages. In essence, it makes it more challenging for an employer to fire their employees, where previously they could simply fire them for pretty much any reason. Uh, now they have to have, uh, it's more complicated to fire employees. Uh, this would have certainly been something the conservative right would have had a problem with, that businesses no longer have total control over who they hire and fire, that they have to now obey rules, laws, and which of course only get more restrictive over the decades as we move on. We get the Social Security Act. Uh, that of course is that old age revolving pension plan, uh, which becomes Social Security which is still considered to be the most popular government program, uh, Social Security, which will benefit almost all Americans. Other than about 5%, 95% of all Americans will be touched by Social Security in their lifetime in some way or another. Uh, it is a program which affects basically everybody other than the very rich. Um, uh, it's the old age revolving pension plan from Townsend, uh, the 200 at 60 plan we just talked about. At the time, though, it's very limited. At the time, it really only gives money to people who are uh, um, disabled, deaf, blind, widowed mothers, or unemployed. Of course, Social Security isn't really for unemployment today. That's really a separate thing. But at the time, Social Security was also designed to give uh, people who are unemployed. It was a type of unemployment insurance. That is, you know, that has changed. It's not really that way now, um, unless you're unemployed as a result of disability, blindness, something like that. And let's see what else I want to include there. And all these programs together is what we will, we will start to call and what is to, knows to starts to be popularly called the welfare state, where we create the first, you know, I'm not going to say that. I, I'm not positive it's the first. Uh, but the largest country in the world with what we would call a welfare state at the time. Um, and we also start to refer to this new type of governing, 
the welfare state is what we're referring to as America. It's, it's now becomes a place where if you need assistance from the government, you need welfare, the government will step in and help you, which of course it only grows and expands over the years. But we also start to call this new type of political system, which is really focused on the working class person, really focused on government helping the American worker, the New Deal liberalism. We start to really refer to as this New Deal liberalism, which is specifically government working to help the working class, not indirectly by, again, helping businesses, but very directly. We should also look at the difference in this liberalism versus earlier liberalism. Earlier liberalism, because you could see this term used back in the 1800s. At that time, it was where the government was creating programs that were beneficial to businesses and industry, basically helping uh, the wealthy, the businesses, industrial uh, powers, and helping large business. This new liberalism, this New Deal liberalism, is the bottom approach. It is helping the workers from the bottom up. Instead of top down, this is more of a bottom up new type of liberalism. Certainly different, uh, certainly different kind of thing. And this is how we generally define liberalism today. Liberalism referring to more government programs, more uh, government assistance, helping the working or the immigrant or the minority or the unemployed, uh, the widowed, the disabled, uh, basically anyone who's down on their luck. Um, this is our idea, this New Deal liberalism. And this is also where we really start to define our two political parties. And we generally have these same definitions today. This is really pretty much the definition of our modern political parties, the two major parties in America. Democrats are more leaning liberal, populist, more for the working class, welfare aid, uh, more government, direct government interaction. Um, and we see conservative uh, Republicans more focused on business, wealthy, capitalism, free market economy, um, less government interaction, less government oversight. And this really comes to being in the 1930s. And it has stayed pretty straight on the course for both of these political parties today, 80 years later, generally speaking. Of course, this is you know, speaking at some generalizations, but generally speaking. All right, we come to the election of 36. Well, by the time we get to 36, um, we have millions and millions of people employed by the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, uh, the Works Progress Administration. But one third of all unemployed people are put to work by the WPA, something like eight, eight to 10 million. And they're primarily doing these infrastructure projects we already talked about, roads, bridges, parks, public buildings, airports, city halls, schools, things like that. We see that uh, almost a third of all unemployed people in America uh, had been employed by the WPA or were employed by 36, 35, 36. Hugely influential in him getting reelected in his winning the election of 36. Uh, again, he got me a job. FDR put food on the, put food on the table. Uh, he is taking care of America. And of course, it's a government program, so people give credit to FDR for doing these things. Um, they go to the polls and boom, they win him very strong, almost a landslide victory in 36. Um, this energizes workers across the nation. This is one of our largest turnouts uh, to the polls, not the biggest, but one of our larger turnouts to the polls. Uh, people coming and voting and it really energizes the Democratic Party and it sort of remakes the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party, just 20 years earlier, was a party that really subjugated and ignored minorities. Now the Democratic Party is the party which embraces minorities and blacks. Um, this makes it the dominant political party in America for the next 30 years. For over a generation, from the 30s to the 60s, this party is the, the sort of the compass for America and pol politics and society. It uh, becomes a dominant party in our nation. All of our presidents are Democrat, except for one. We have uh, we have one in there, uh, Eisenhower. But for the next 30 years, all of our presidents are Democrats, and uh, with that one exception. And it really shapes our society. Uh, the Supreme Court gets controlled by the Democrat, uh, more liberal leaning. It's really interesting how influential what FDR did was really upon uh, the civil rights movement. Had FDR not come in, into this, 
had we not had an FDR or someone like him, the civil rights movement would have probably been much different. It really probably would have been. It could be said in many ways, this new movement towards the working class and minorities helped really empower uh, many minority peoples, women, uh, African-Americans. It certainly changes how America functions socio sociopolitically. It changes everything. Um, very interesting how it does. He wins all but two states. Uh, all but two states. Certainly the most popular man in America. Well, after winning, he does something which was wrong. There's really no way to put it. He actually tries to change the Constitution to change the Supreme Court. He wants to rewrite the Constitution, probably an amendment of uh, some sort, to actually make it uh, to where after age 70 you were forced to retire. You had to retire. Now, what would this have done? This was certainly an end run around. Um, what he would have done by if he had actually, this doesn't happen, but had he got this change, this constitutional amendment changed, it would have allowed him to replace older conservative judges on the court with younger liberal judges. It was specifically designed, his plan, to keep his programs in place. Now, in his mind, he probably thought he was doing the right thing to help America. Nonetheless, it was undoubtedly a situation of executive overreach. He was trying to change the Constitution to further his own political goals. Uh, unacceptable. Um, certainly unacceptable. You can make uh, criticisms of Supreme Court all you like. And there are certainly valid criticisms, but changing the court structure just so you can get justices on there that benefit you and your political ideology is wrong, just plain wrong. So nonetheless, uh, he wanted to do that. Uh, it didn't occur. Thank goodness. Uh, it should not have occurred. It was really despicable, actually. Um, certainly, again, to, to say FDR was perfect would be foolish. He certainly wasn't. He made a lot of mistakes. Uh, this is certainly one glaring one. Uh, however, the irony there is um, he didn't need to because he was elected four times as president. He does actually get to pack the court with conservative justices. By the time he leaves office, uh, pardon me, liberal justices, by the time he leaves office, uh, the court has really swung his direction. Now, whether it's because of the justices he got on the court or was it simply because the American public opinion was really populist? It really was. So maybe he was simply following public opinion, uh, or excuse me, the court following public opinion. Either way, um, he does uh, ultimately end up with a more a liberal Supreme Court by the time he's out of office. Significant, hugely significant. Uh, the NLRB is upheld and is not removed. The Social Security Act and Social Security Administration is upheld and not removed. Uh, had those things come into being in the early 30s, it's certainly conceivable the court would have declared them unconstitutional as simply overreach. They don't. Uh, they stay on the books. They stay part of law. They stay government administrations, uh, which continue to affect America for generations to come. So he does ultimately get what he wants on the court, but he gets it legally versus his attempt to uh, run around the Constitution and make changes. Because, I mean, they had repealed several of his plans earlier, uh, repealed or declared them unconstitutional. He didn't want it to happen again. Well, he gets his way. Although, yeah. Ultimately, what we see by the end of his presidency, when he, you know, he, he, he's, uh, he dies in office in 45, by the end of his time in office, um, we actually see a new constitutional interpretation. We start to call the Constitution a living document. I don't know exactly when that term comes into play, but the idea there is that the Constitution should adapt to the times. And let's face it, 1930s, 1940s is much, much different than the 1780s. Uh, 1789, when the Constitution was written, much, much different world, much, much different world. So to think in 150 years that we should not interpret the Constitution differently would be foolish. And we start to see that. And we start to see a Constitution and a constitutional interpretation of the Supreme Court that government should actually take a much more direct role in America's lives, Americans' lives. And uh, generally speaking, the court has followed that line ever since, generally speaking.
All right. The New Deal's impact on society. So what we have now in our, our last section on here, really we see what we'll call a people's democracy for the first time. We really have a government that is for maybe the first time in our history, truly focused on helping every individual American. Um, that may be a bit of an oversimplification, but, or exaggeration, I suppose. Nonetheless, it's the closest we've ever been uh, up to this time period. We really see liberty for all white, generally speaking. We see federal spending uh, increase dramatically. Uh, we see uh, federal spending go from three to over nine billion dollars a year. Uh, massive billions of dollar budget deficit. That might not seem like much today, but for the time, billions of dollars was not a, a, a number most people ever used. The idea of billions. It was a very large number. Most of this was due to FDR's programs. FDR's uh, programs and Congress's programs. Uh, and you should certainly understand Congress is on board with this. They're the ones that pass most of these laws, even though FDR signs them. So Congress has also leaned to the left, more populist. However, it's what the constituents want. The vast majority of Americans are, as I said, the 36th election, he won all but two states. So the vast majority of Americans are on board with what FDR is, is changing in America, the changes he's bringing about. And this idea to where everybody could take advantage of the New Deal, the government was actually out there to help everybody, and it wasn't just about benefiting the middle and upper classes. We do see really this idea of liberty for all people. It should be noted this is primarily programs that help uh, white people. However, that is most of America. At this point in time, about 90% of the American population is white, or very close to that. Um, also, it should be noted that most of these programs, while they do not specifically target minorities, which are the hardest hit in America in this time period, many of them have a trickle-down effect. Um, many minority people, many African Americans are able to take advantage of Social Security. Uh, we see many immigrants take advantage of these programs. Many African Americans worked for the WPA, the PWA, the CCC, these different organizations. So while specifically they weren't designed to target uh, the minorities or African Americans or Native Americans or Asian Americans, because they do, most of those people do fit into the bottom 50% socioeconomically, it does greatly benefit most of those folks uh, in some capacity. We also see it help women. We also see an expansion of women into the New Deal, new programs. Frances Perkin, for instance, was the first woman named to a presidential cabinet spot, the Secretary of Labor. Uh, very influential, certainly helped and inspired other women into, uh, into uh, excelling, into business, into going to school. We see increases in the number of women in school, college. Uh, we see, as I already mentioned, an increase in the number of women working. Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt seen as the conscience of the New Deal. She was the most public first lady up to this time period. And we see her uh, taking a very strong advocacy uh, role for women and working women and um, uh, young women to go out and get education, to get a job, take care of themselves, to be contributing members of society, not just wives and daughters. So the New Deal, and generally speaking, the Great Depression, was probably beneficial, uh, generally speaking, to women and women's rights and women's opportunities. Uh, it probably we could see it was. We really see people really take the New Deal and take this programs of the Democratic Party and of FDR as opportunity. For the first time in America, for many, many working class people to not be taken advantage of by the system, by industry, by large corporations, large industrial uh, associations, to where people can actually have opportunities, even though they're, they're poor, lower income, working class people. We see access to federal office for the first time. We see dozens of women hired into Washington, D.C. in federal offices. We see women politicians in Washington uh, for the first time. Don't get me wrong, government is still majority white male. 
But we do see people of color, we do see women, black men, black women, and white women in government in increasing numbers uh, that they were, generally speaking, blocked before this time period. Certainly not in proper proportion. Again, half the American population is, is female, so we certainly don't even begin to see half of our politicians being women. We still don't have that today in 2020. We still, uh, the majority of our politicians are still men, even though half the American population is female. So we still haven't reached parity yet, uh, but it's certainly, it's a step. It's a step in the right direction. Um, things certainly aren't rosy. Um, while the African-American community, who used to be the party of Lincoln, are now the party of Roosevelt, the party of FDR, and henceforth, for the next 80 years up until today, African-Americans have been the party, uh, the Democrat, uh, loyal to the Democratic Party. Um, that loyalty has persisted through multiple generations. And we do see access to federal office for the first time. We see uh, African-American men and women working in Washington for the first time, public positions. Um, we certainly see opportunities there. It should be noted very clearly that we still have segregation exclusion. We still have Jim Crow segregation. We have unfair labor practices regarding minorities and blacks. Um, we're not even, even talking about housing discrimination and redlining and things like that, which those will come up in later chapters. Um, all that is still going on. Segregation, violence. Uh, there was a lot of pressure in FDR to make a lynching law to make an anti-lynching law, that lynching was, they didn't use the term hate crime back then, but that's what it would have been. In, in essence, it would have made lynching a hate crime. Of course, lynching's murder. So there's laws against murder. That was the biggest argument made against lynching. Hey, lynching's already against the law. It's murder. You can't murder somebody. But of course, lynching has a, a more socio-cultural meaning beyond just simply killing someone. It is a thing that has historically been used by white mobs against black minorities, uh, unfair, uh, often trumped up crimes, uh, false charges, simply excuses used to murder uh, black black people, um, primarily black men. He won't do that. What FDR has to do uh, is walk a line between doing all these things to help, all these things to help working class minorities, but he still has to bring along the majority of America to get reelected. And the majority of America is not black. African Americans make up 10% of the population or a little less. So he does not really do anything to directly favor blacks. Well, then why, why does the black population become so, um, so loyal to the Democrats and FDR? Because his programs dramatically help the working class, the poor and the working class, which is where most black people fit in. So even though he created programs that did not specifically target minorities, or even women, most of his programs specifically help minorities and women. So uh, Roosevelt, of course, needed all Southern Democrats. Of course, uh, Democratic Party is still incredibly strong, strong in the Southern and the Midwestern states. So he needs those states to continue to get reelected. As I said before, the most important thing to any politician is reelection, and uh, because they can't help you otherwise. So, yeah. Um, lots of changes, but he really specifically leaves issues on the table, leaves them alone, where they specifically deal with minorities, especially blacks, um, to continue to cater to the Southern white Democratic majority. Indian policy is interesting. Our Native American policy, our Native Americans probably are most powerless group in America, uh, truthfully. They're a very small percentage, but, well, put it this way. Unemployment among Native Americans, 90%. Uh, highest rates of drug use, alcohol abuse. Uh, lowest rates of education. Powerless, maybe our most disenfranchised group in America. Talked about not that much because they're such a small percentage, but they're still, at this time period, hundreds of thousands, and they have almost no rights. Well, we do actually see some changes. We actually see John Collier, who's the head of the BIA, which is the Bureau of Indian Affairs. John Collier, head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, a government office, the BIA. He helps get, get past the Indian New Deal in 1934. That's what it was commonly called, Indian New Deal. That's the, it's in quotes. The official name of it was the Indian Reorganization Act. 
the Indian Reorganization Act. In essence, it was the New Deal, specifically targeting Native Americans, or Indians, as they were referred to them at the time. It does all kinds of things. It gives them religious freedoms, religious opportunities, political freedoms. Some, some Native American tribes actually start to form their own governments. It gives them limited sovereignty. In essence, it makes them semi-sovereign. They are partially independent states. That's a political term. We would probably better the term I'd use is country. Basically, it makes them partly independent countries within our greater country of the United States, giving them semi-sovereign status. Some of them make up their own governments. I mean, today, some Native American tribes have their own president. They have their own constitutions. They even have their own congresses of an Indian tribe. Um, all that begins here under the 1930s under the Indian Reorganization Act. Religious freedom. And again, if you understand the history of Native Americans in America, we had spent all of our time in America up to this time period basically oppressing and forced assimilation or simply destruction of Native American culture. And we start to turn some of that around. We start to change some of that under the Indian Reorganization Act, the Indian New Deal of 34. And John Collier needs to get a lot of credit for that. He really helped bring the plight of Native Americans to Congress and talk to Congress and to the president, and we do get some of these changes made. They're not great, but they are certainly a step forward uh, to some type of help for a group that has, for almost all of American history, well, I mean, it's just short of genocide, uh, what we did to the Native Americans, what America did to the American Indians. So it's certainly a step to redress some of the terrible crimes that were committed against them for most of American history. Struggles in the West continue, um, especially migrant. Migrant workers and immigrant workers are a large number of workers in the West. But California, from Texas over to California, we have hundreds of thousands of immigrant workers, uh, Mexican at this point in time. Latino is, is the word we'd use, we'd say Mexican, because most of them coming across the border were from Mexico. So we have large numbers of Mexicans, large numbers of Asian peoples coming in across the Pacific, uh, many of them legal and illegal coming into America, uh, and a large number of them working our farms, our agriculture production. The government promoted repatriation. It's a polite way of saying, today we would probably use the term, um, oh, I blanks here uh, for a moment, but uh, deportation, we're basically we're deporting them out of the country repatriating them is the idea of putting them back inside their their proper country repatriation but it's deporting uh, the government would do this in the off season we would allow them to come in the country during the growing season work our crops harvest our crops and then in the off season we would repatriate them we would kick them back across the border um, and then conveniently the next season there'd be no border patrol when the next growing season came and then they could all just come back across the border um, illegal immigrants and legal, you know, both. Very little government assistance, very little help from the government. Uh, most of these programs that came out under FDR specifically excluded agricultural workers. So you actually couldn't get assistance to these programs if you were a farm worker, which of course is mostly minority, black, Latino, Mexican, Asian uh, peoples. Yeah. Um, we see some movements to try and redress that, to try and uh, to try and use New Deal funds to assist immigrants. We see the Mexican American movement coming along. A Mexican American movement was organized to uh, help to give assistance, support, legal support, to help unionize, which didn't have much success. Uh, Mexican-American workers, uh, both legal and illegal, uh, about 50-50. We think about half the workers that worked in the, the Southwest, the, the West and Southwest from California to Texas were legal and by half illegal. Um, many of these people were supporters of the, the FDR, supporters of the New Deal, supporters of the Democratic Party. Discrimination continues, though. Discrimination and pressure continues, especially when you go to California. California was the most discriminatory state versus when it came to Asian Americans. Uh, we created a whole slew, uh, and we, I say we, I live in California, 
Uh, California at the time created a whole slew of laws, uh, restrictions, codes, all to keep Native Americans, pardon me, Asian Americans from owning land, owning property, having jobs, owning businesses, voting. California was famous for this, or infamous might be a better way to put it, for creating laws that specifically disenfranchised and discriminated against Asian Americans, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Japanese. Um, yeah, it was really tough. It was a really tough situation on the West Coast for Asian immigrants. What type of work did these folks do, whether they were Mexican, Mexican-American, Latino, Asian? They often did the worst work, too. They often did the lowest pay work, the most dirty work, uh, service work, uh, domestic work, agricultural work which had several things in common, which, which really exacerbated the whole problem. One, many of these jobs were part-time or seasonal. Many of these jobs paid poorly. Uh, these jobs were generally not unionized. Um, so poor work, poor pay, no unions, uh, no job security, seasonal work. All of it added together to make it a really bad situation for these folks. However, it should be noted that the New Deal did help many of them, even though the programs didn't specifically target them, because the programs helped workers and poor in general, many of these programs did help. And sometimes they actually used the money to specifically create programs at the local or state level that did indeed actually help uh, Native Americans, Mexican Americans, Asian Americans. So generally speaking, the overall results, good for most people in America. Most people were assisted and benefited by the New Deal and the second New Deal programs. Minorities less so. No, very little direct benefit, but quite a bit of indirect benefit, simply by their socioeconomic place in society. However, when it's all said and done, we do find the majority of immigrant population leaning towards the Democratic Party by the 1940s. It really becomes a foundation, a base of the Democratic Party over the next generation or two. Here we have Mexican-American farm workers. Uh, this is Pixley, California. And the, the sign on the, on the side of the truck reads, the governor, this would be the governor of California, sends aid to Pixley. And the aid is in the form of 24 deputy sheriffs and is it 11? 11 highway patrolmen. You know what we want? We want food. That's what these women, these women and children want, these women and girls want. They want food. So the aid the government sends them is police to, in essence, repatriate them. And this was really bad in so many ways. We wanted these people here to work our farms really cheap, really cheap labor to produce the food for America. And then we didn't want them to enjoy the fruits of their labor, no pun intended. Uh, we then wanted to kick them out, grow our food, harvest our food, and then get the hell out. That's what our government was saying. That's what business were saying. That's what the police were saying. Um, and what do the people need? They're starving. It's a weird, tragic irony. They're picking food, but then they're starving. Now, don't get me wrong. There's lots of agricultural products that are not edible. But still, most of them were picking produce and growing produce, but they couldn't eat it. Uh, they had to turn the produce in, and then they would get very meager pay or ver very meager pay. And another real tragedy of this is because many people would come here uh, from across the border, and they would get separated from their families because most of the products that were grown on the farms was gender uh, separated, division of labor based on gender. The women and girls worked in one field producing one type of crop, and the men and boys worked in another field producing a different type of crop. So then when the government would show up and pick these people up, they would grab everybody up and take them back across the border, only it would just be the, the male part of the family or the female part of the family. It could sometimes take months or even potentially years for husbands and wives, brothers and sisters to reconnect to find each other as they get sent back across the border and separated. Very tragic. Um, and then f another third aspect of this is, of course, the, um, the issue that about half of these people working these farms in agriculture, actually over half, 
were American citizens. They were Mexican Americans. They weren't illegal immigrants. Many of them were American citizens that were gathered up and thrown across the border because they all looked alike. And very problematic. If you get kicked back across the border and you don't have some type of paperwork that verifies you're an American citizen, which would have probably been very common back then. I mean, a lot of people didn't walk around with identification saying they're an American citizen. How, what about when you try to get back across the border? Um, it could take you weeks or months. Your house is gone. Your car is gone if you had a car. You know, because you can't pay the rent because you're, you're in another country. Um, many people's lives were destroyed by this repatriation, this deportation. And many of these were American citizens. So their rights, their entire constitutional rights are being violated. Uh, straight up and down the board. All their rights being violated. Uh, tragic uh, in many ways. All right. The last thing we're going to talk about. Uh, the last thing we're going to talk about, and is, this is where we'll end this chapter, is how the environment changes during the Great Depression. Um, most of you are familiar with the Dust Bowl. You've heard of the Dust Bowl, at least. Um, the first Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, thought of himself as a conservationist president. He really had this uh, idea where he was, um, he's, he's the president who first signed into law, uh, laws creating national parks and uh, the Lacey Act came about under him being president. And he really thought of himself as that way. Well, FDR, his cousin, also thought the same thing. He saw himself as a conservationist president. Well, he really wanted to reshape the environment for human use. And this was a big controversy at the time. What should the natural environment be used for? Conservation, protected, fenced off, used for as often for um, leisure activities, protected for our future generations, or should we use it ourselves? Now, had there not been a depression, it seems pretty obvious FDR would have leaned towards conservation. He would have probably created a lot more parks, a lot more national monuments, a lot more forests. He would have fenced off a lot more land. It seems pretty obvious. He made, it, he made it apparent that's what he wanted to do. However, during the Depression, there is a higher need, the human need, uh, for a country in crisis. And so his gospel of conservation is very interesting. It's mixed. He does both. We see him focus on trying to protect the environment where possible, but at the same time using the environment or manipulating the environment for human use. And we'll see a couple of really good examples here, the Dust Bowl and the Tennessee Valley Authority. The Dust Bowl occurred from 30 to 41, uh, affected, directly affected almost 400,000 uh, Americans, mostly in the Midwest. Uh, they were often referred to as Okies because many of them came from Oklahoma, but they also came from Kansas and Texas and other states. What happened was, simply put, Years and years of misuse of the land, destroyed the soil. We soaked up all the water out and all the nutrients out of the land. The soil dried up. The grasses were all eaten by the cows or all cut down by the farmers. And you combine that with drought, which hits multiple times in the 20s and 30s, high winds, low moisture in the soil, all the grasses and trees cut down, we end up with what is known as the Dust Bowl. Uh, we destroy the natural environment across the Midwest of the United States. I'm going to come back to this here, but I'm going to show you the picture. This entire yellow area is this region all the way up into Canada where we destroy the natural environment, take all the water out of the soil, use up all the nutrients, cut down all the trees, eat up all the grasses. We make a desert of the Midwest United States, uh, a place which historically all, well, forever, pretty much, uh, had been grasslands. Now, this isn't the first time we did something like this. We did something like this back in the late 1800s. Well, with this massive uh, deforestation, uh, soil erosion, we see hundreds of thousands of people having to leave the Midwest looking for work, farm work, other places. Most of them go west towards California. They're mostly white. 
their only options, if you wanted to continue to be a farmer, was either east or west. If you go east, that is primarily African-American sharecroppers in the south, southern states. Large majority of African-American sharecroppers. Most whites here did not have an interest in joining the black farming community, so most of them go westward, looking for farming opportunities out towards California. And so they migrate. The major road at the time, this is long before there were freeways, is Route 66, which still exists today. It goes all the way to Santa Monica, California, all the way up here to Chicago. And they followed this Route 66 westward and looking for work, looking for jobs, looking for opportunities, mostly in farming. Mostly. Now, conservation services, the Soil Conservation Corps, for instance, another one of these agencies, one of these government alphabet agencies, um, tried to stop erosion, tried to educate. They actually built schools, farming schools, to teach people how to farm better, use better products. They also built these shelter belts. They planted over 220 million trees. Trees serve multiple purposes in this desert, this dust bowl of the Midwest. The trees are able to hold water in the land. The water is actually protected from, the land is protected from the sun, which keeps, which reduces soil erosion and the drying out, the evaporation of the moisture. Plus the roots of the trees actually hold moisture in. Um, and they also have another purpose. They stop the wind. The wind was one of the biggest problems. With the fact that the trees and the grasses were gone, the wind would simply come along and blow away all the soil. How you can't, none of us are really farmers, you can't farm and plant crops if the soil is gone. All your good topsoil is gone, boom, you can't grow anything. Um, uh, and so between the drought, the winds, the erosion, you have Soil Conservation Corps, the U.S. government, this is funded by uh, New Deal funds, planting millions of trees, educating new classes, uh, we have um, lots of conservation engineers going out there. We pretty much, over a 15-year period, rebuild the entire Midwest. We tap into underground water reservoirs. We ship in water. We do build dams and bridges and um, power plants. We reshape the entire Midwest uh, to stop this from occurring. Um, Another thing which happens in the southeast, the Tennessee Valley Authority. This is this region here. This is a region of about seven different states. You have Illinois here, Arkansas, Texas over here, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. This entire region was one of the most underused regions in the entire U.S. The reason was it was a swamp. Pretty much the entire Tennessee Valley was just one large swamp. It was almost unusable. Now, many people still live there, but you couldn't really... You couldn't do much productively. Uh, it was water. Most of it was under sea level, incredibly wet. It's weirdly ironic. The problem here was no water. The problem here, too much water. A nice, it would have been nice if we could have just taken all this water and moved it over here, right? Yeah, it doesn't work that way. So they had to find a way to, in essence, drain the entire Tennessee Valley. And once it was drained, it actually becomes some of the most productive uh, valuable land in our entire country. Uh, it becomes the center of the southern white middle class uh, in coming years. They modernize it, bring in technology, bring in electricity, they build dams, hydroelectric dams, they industrialize it, they build ultimately millions of homes uh, over many years. It becomes, by the 1940s and 50s, one of the best places to live in America. Uh, Interestingly enough, though, what do they do? Because before it had been very poor, large black population, many of these places are not affordable for blacks. Many black people actually get pushed out of these areas as they do all this, as we build all this, as we, in essence, bring the Tennessee Valley into the modern age. It could be said in the Tennessee Valley, it was 50 years behind modernity, 50 years behind as far as most people there didn't have electricity, didn't have running water, uh, there were very few roads. Yeah, it was it was it was bad. Um, New Deal money is used to bring it into the modern age, and as a result, it becomes very successful, very wealthy, lots of land, lots of money, and lots of people. Different ways that we see FDR's gospel of conservation reshape the natural environment for the benefit of all Americans.
And I believe that is going to be it for this chapter. Thank you for watching. And uh, remember, if you have questions, you'll need to post them on Canvas. Um, that will uh, post your questions there on Canvas about the chapter for me or your fellow students to look at or to answer. And we will talk again soon. Thanks.